and brighter than the sun. At Calvary for everyone. Well, we've read about God's amazing grace, and we've just sung about God's amazing grace. And in my time with you last Sunday morning, I talked with you at some length about God's amazing grace. But I want to say something to you this morning that is intentionally provocative. In fact, it may very well be shocking to your ears. Because I want you to know that God's grace is not that amazing. Now please understand that when I say that, I am not saying that God's grace is not amazing. I am saying that God's grace is not as amazing as many people think. I'm saying that God's grace doesn't do what many people think it does. Jude warns us about those who would abuse the grace of God. He writes in Jude verse 4, For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now Jude is talking about some folks in his day who were perverting the grace of God. They were teaching that God's grace does some things that God's grace just doesn't do. Some people today seem to have the idea that God's grace is so amazing that we have a license to sin. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you that God's grace is not that amazing. Many people today seem to have the idea that if they live a good moral life and they avoid the big black sins, that God's grace will overlook minor infractions. Now there's nothing new about that idea. Evidently there were some in the city of Rome who had that idea in the days of the Apostle Paul. 
But Paul clearly refutes that idea in the opening verses of Romans chapter 6. Notice he says, beginning in verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And Paul answers that question, certainly not. And he asks another question, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Later on in this chapter, Paul says in verse 14 and 15, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Paul says, certainly not. There's folks today, and there were folks in the days of Paul who seemed to have the idea that because God's grace is so amazing and so wonderful, we can pretty much live our lives any way we want to, and God's grace will take care of that. And Paul says, taint so. God's grace is not that amazing. God's grace will not do that. In fact, in his letter to Titus, Paul teaches that God's grace teaches us to stop sinning. Listen to his words, Titus chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Do you see what Paul's saying? He says that God's grace has appeared to all men, but it teaches us that we can't live wicked lives anymore, and we must live righteously before God. Some people have the idea that God's grace is so amazing that we don't have to do anything to be saved. But ladies and gentlemen, God's grace is not that amazing. God's grace doesn't teach that. Now folks who have this idea, they do believe, they do understand that sinners must believe in order to be saved, but then they turn right around and tell us that God gives sinners that saving faith. Did you know that that's what some folks believe? They believe that you have to believe to be saved, but they believe that God gives the sinner that saving faith, and he can't have it any other way. And they will appeal to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, where Paul says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the grace of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And they tell us that when Paul says it is the gift of God, that means faith. That faith is the gift of God. You've got to believe to be saved, but God gives you that saving faith. And therefore, there's nothing that you can do to be saved. God does it all. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that just doesn't work in the original language. Because the words grace and faith 
are in the feminine gender and the word gift and that word that are in the neuter gender and that means that when Paul says it is the gift of God he doesn't mean that faith is the gift of God but that salvation itself is the gift of God. The United Bible Society handbook which is a handbook designed for translators of the Bible. It's designed to assist them in their translation work. And I want you to notice what it says about this passage. Some take the words and this in verse 8 to refer to the preceding faith. But it seems more likely that the Greek neuter pronouns refer to the whole preceding event, that is, salvation by God's grace through faith and not just to faith, which in Greek is a feminine noun. Now I realize that that sounds kind of technical. It's really above my pay break my pay grade, I understand that, but I wanted to share that statement with you to let you know I'm just not telling you something off the top of my head. But those who work in translating scripture make the same point that I've made. A renowned Greek scholar by the name of A.T. Robinson said, and that neuter, not feminine, and so refers not to faith or to grace, he gives the Greek words, but to the act of being saved by grace conditioned on faith on our part. Paul is not saying here that faith is a gift from God. He's saying that salvation is a gift from God. Furthermore, the New Testament clearly teaches that salvation by God's grace is not unconditional. Now I strongly suspect that most everybody in this assembly who can listen to me with understanding already understands what I'm saying here. But let me tell you folks, your friends and your neighbors do not always understand this. Let me express the point in the form of a syllogism, the major premise being that the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men. We read that passage just a few moments ago. And yet I know that you know that the New Testament also teaches that not everybody's going to be saved. Jesus talks about that two ro those two roads you can walk. There's the narrow road that leads to life, and there's the broad road that leads to destruction. And Jesus said, few are going to be on the narrow road, and many are going to be on the broad road. And you know what that means? That means not everybody's going to be saved. Therefore, we must conclude that the grace of God is conditioned upon man's response. By that I mean the benefits of God's grace. God has extended his grace to everyone, but not everyone will enjoy the benefits of his grace. Some folks tell us that God's grace is so amazing that strict obedience is not necessary. But folks, God's grace is not that amazing. Many people seem to have the idea that obedience is not a condition for salvation, but rather it's the byproduct of salvation. 
In other words, they tell us you don't have to obey God to be saved. That comes through faith alone. But obedience to God is a byproduct of your salvation. You obey God because you're saved. And folks, the fact of the matter is that both things are true. The New Testament teaches that we obey God because we're saved, but it also teaches that we obey God in order to be saved. This is not an either-or proposition. It's a both-and. Both things are true. John writes in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 29, If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. We obey Christ because we're saved. But ladies and gentlemen, the New Testament also teaches that obedience is a condition for salvation. In Romans chapter 2, and remember the book of Romans is Paul's great treatise on justification by faith. He says in verse 8, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek. Though that will be the result. If you don't obey Christ, you're going to receive indignation and wrath and tribulation and anguish. But then Paul goes on to say, verse 10, But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Well, if you want to receive glory, honor, and peace, how, how do you do that? How can you do that? Well, Paul says that those blessings come to the one who works what is good. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 17, Paul writes, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. When were they set free from sin? Well, isn't it obvious that it's after they obey that form of doctrine that Paul's talking about? But perhaps the clearest passage in all the New Testament is in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, when the writer says of Jesus, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered, and having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Who is Jesus going to say? those who obey Him. Is obedience a condition of salvation? The Hebrew writer says it is. Peter writes in 1 Peter 1 verse 22, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. How did they purify their souls? Peter says it was in obeying the truth. You see, ladies and gentlemen, both of these concepts are biblical. Yes, there are some passages that teach that we obey Christ as a byproduct of our salvation. 
But there are other passages that teach that we obey Him as a condition of our salvation. Both concepts are true. Now, when we strictly obey the Lord, we have not worked for our salvation or earned our salvation. Jesus tells us in Luke 17, verse 10, So likewise you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. When we obey Christ carefully and strictly, we haven't earned anything. We're still unprofitable servants, Jesus said. You see, there's a big difference. Listen to me carefully. There is a big difference between strict obedience and perfect obedience. Paul has a lot to say about obedience in the book of Romans. Again, that was his great treatise on justification by faith. But at the beginning of the book and at the end of the book, he talks about the obedience of faith. He talks about living by faith. He says the disobedient will receive wrath that we must walk in the steps of Abraham's faith, that we must walk in newness of life. He talks about obeying that form of doctrine. You see, when Paul talks about works, he's not talking about obedience. How do I know that? Well, because he tells us that we're not saved by works. But New Testament passages clearly tell us that we're saved by obedience. Well, if we're not saved by works, but we are saved by obedience, what must we conclude? Works, as Paul uses the term, and obedience are not the same thing. Paul teaches that by works of law shall no flesh be justified. Can't be justified by works of law. But we need to ask the question, why not? Why is that impossible? Well, folks, that's impossible because law demands perfect obedience. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3. And notice what Paul says beginning in verse 10. Galatians 3.10 For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse... For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith, yet the law is not of faith. But the man who does them shall live by them. And folks, that means does them perfectly. That's how someone is justified by law or works of law, by keeping law perfectly. Do we do that? We don't do that. We don't keep God's law perfectly. Well, if you're going to be justified on the basis of law, 
by keeping the law perfectly, and we don't keep the law perfectly, we can't be justified that way. We can't be justified on the basis of law because law demands perfection and we don't give the law perfection. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 4. <clears throat> And notice what Paul says in the first five verses. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Now let me see if I can unpack this for us. We've already noted that law demands perfection. You keep the law you're blessed. You break the law, you're punished. Now we might break the law, man's law, and not be punished because we don't get caught. Right? You ever run a stop sign and you weren't punished because there was no Jeff Davidson around to catch you? Done that, got, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. So I broke the law, and I, I didn't do it on purpose, but, but I broke the law, and I wasn't punished because Jeff wasn't there to catch me. But now when it comes to God's law, that presents us with a real big problem, doesn't it? Because we can't, we can't fool God, right? God sees everything and He knows everything and He knows when we've broken His law, right? Law demands perfection. Abraham's works only took him so far towards perfection. Did Abraham keep God's law perfectly? Everybody who knows anything about Abraham's life, you know that he didn't do that. Paul says his faith was accounted to him for righteousness. His works took him only so far, didn't take him to the demands of law, but God says, I'm going to count your faith for righteousness. God grades on the curve, folks, based upon our faith. But folks, Jesus taught strict obedience. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 19, he said, Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Let me stop for a moment. That doesn't mean that you're going to be in the nosebleed section up in heaven, far removed from the throne. No, that means you're not going to be there. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches them and so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. 
In Matthew's account of the Great Commission, Jesus instructed the apostles to go and make disciples of all the nations, and he explained how they were to do that. They were to do that by baptizing folks in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and by teaching them to observe what? All things that I have commanded you. Did Jesus teach strict obedience? Of course he did. And the apostles taught strict obedience as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, Paul says, Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. Don't overlook those two words, just as. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9, Paul writes, For to this end I also wrote that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all all things. The fact of the matter is saving faith includes obedience. Notice how the American Standard Version translates John 3 verse 36, He that believeth on the Son hath eternal life, but he that obeyeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Notice that believing and obeying not are contrasted with one another. In Romans 10, Paul says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report. In these passages, Belief and obedience are equated, or maybe I should say it better, faith includes obedience. Jesus uses the Greek word pistuvo, not apisteo, which would be the opposite, but rather apitheo. It's a different word. In James chapter 2, when James talks about justification by works, he argues that faith only does not save, it does not profit, it's dead, it cannot be shown or demonstrated, it's no more than what demons have. Faith alone didn't justify Abraham. It is imperfect. It's not accounted for righteousness. It does not justify. Paul and James are not contradicting one another because when Paul writes about faith, he's using faith in the comprehensive sense, the kind of faith that obeys God, the kind of faith that walks in the steps of Abraham. James is talking about a different kind of faith, a faith that doesn't obey God. And he's saying that faith won't save anybody. Well, some folks tell us that God's grace is so amazing that doctrinal differences just are unimportant. But folks, God's grace is not that amazing. Every New Testament book that talks about the importance of grace also talks about the importance of doctrine. For example, in Acts chapter 13, Luke writes in verse 43, Now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas uh, 
who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. But Luke has already told us in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and prayer. Well, time will not allow us to look at other passages on this chart, but I assure you that I have looked at those passages and I could share those with you if time allowed. Some folks have the idea that God's grace is so amazing that baptism is not essential to salvation. But God's grace is not that amazing. There are many New Testament passages that talk about the essentiality of baptism. Jesus says in Mark 16, 16, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. Peter told the Jews on Pentecost when they asked the question, Men and brethren, what shall we do? He told them to repent and let every one of you be baptized for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Ananias told Saul of Tarsus in Acts 22, 16, Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. I talked with you recently about Bible baptism, and we looked at many other passages. The New Testament clearly teaches that baptism stands between the sinner and salvation, the kingdom of God, remission of sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the washing away of sins, newness of life, being of Christ, being in the body of Christ, being a child of God, putting on Christ, cleansing, sanctification, putting off the body of the flesh, forgiveness, a good conscience. Notice what Paul tells Titus in Titus chapter 3. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. I want you to notice that Paul talks about the kindness of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God. He talks about Jesus Christ our Savior, and he says we're not saved by works. But he says we are saved through the washing of regeneration. That preposition denotes of means or instrument or agency by means of. Paul is saying by means of the washing of regeneration, God saves us. Well, may I remind you that the new birth is a birth of water. And baptism is a washing. When Paul talks about works, he's not talking about baptism. How do I know that? He says we're not saved by works, but he does say we're saved through the washing of regeneration. Therefore, water baptism is not the kind of work that doesn't save. Well, quickly, one last point. Some folks would have us believe that God's grace is so amazing that final salvation is assured. 
But ladies and gentlemen, God's grace is just not that amazing. Because man can resist God's grace. He can reject the invitation of the Lord. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus says in verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Paul indicates that it's possible to receive the grace of God in vain. It's possible to turn away from God's grace, to fall short of God's grace, to fall away from God's grace. Now, as I wrap things up, let me say to you, if you go away from here this morning and you say, Kevin doesn't believe in the grace of God, and Kevin doesn't think that God's grace is amazing, that's just not correct. Either I have been very unclear, and I don't think that's the case, or you have misunderstood what I'm saying. Let me say categorically, I believe in God's grace, and I believe that it is truly amazing, but it's not as amazing as some people think. It doesn't do everything that many people claim that it does. Our salvation is by grace. But we must accept the gift of salvation through faith by meeting God's conditions of pardon. And if you've not done that, we would urge you to obey the gospel do what Peter told the Jews on Pentecost to do. He didn't have to tell them to believe. They already believed. They wouldn't have asked the question, what shall we do to be saved otherwise? He told those believers to repent and be baptized. That's what I'm telling you to do. If that's not what you've done, and we would be honored to help you, will you respond to the gospel now as we stand and we sing?